Hello and welcome to Beyond Top 10 Tennis. My name is Dr. Ashley morgan Burge, and I'm your host. I'm the author of 12 books, a CEO of 13 years, founder of a startup set on data privacy, most importantly, an elite performance coach of over 19 years, having worked with athletes throughout Europe, the United States to Australia. Most excitingly, I am the world's leading scientist on coach and athlete performance, specifically behind how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking. My work includes everything from mitigating injuries to to conditioning behaviours that set a player up long term for the long game towards a top 10 tennis ranking. I'm behind theories from the optimal performance theory, optimal behaviour for optimal performance, the barrier breaker, the rule of transference to the golden rule. As has become custom, each episode we dive into the latest rankings and results on the WTA and ATP tours and deliver new data implications as shared in my latest release, How to Develop a Top 10 Tennis Ranking with over 80 episodes to date. Today's insights and key topic plays its own role like so many other episodes in developing the player, parent to coach for that road ahead towards a top 10 tennis ranking. So as always, buckle in and enjoy the ride. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, If you've been with us for some time now, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Uh, If this is one of your first episodes, as always, I really do encourage you to track back to some of our early episodes around, let's say, the 50 to 60 mark to really get a feel of where we've been, how we've transitioned, especially this season, um, diving into our real time essentially insights on both the WTA and ATP tours where last season was a very different story where we really set the foundations to or for what's to come which really d- digged a little bit deeper into the data the insights um one of my texts uh, um the secrets to optimal performance success and we got about halfway through the secrets to optimal coaching success before we made this transition which really ran parallel with the Australian Open so I'm really excited and I'm sure I hope you can hear it because the French Open is now just around the corner and we've really been leading up to this point but for the better part of the last say six to eight weeks where we've really been tracking some key performances uh, key players and their uh, underlying metrics also highlighting the rankings on both tours and showcasing that 50 percent of players inside the top 10 are not um, aligning with that ranking so we have really touched on that we'll touch on that um, a bit more today and, and showcase why and those underlying reasons but rome has wrapped up and last week i really had to hold back on sharing more because I made that decision just to wait to share those additional rounds even though um, it hadn't wrapped up yet but there were some really interesting insights unwrapping very early on so I really want to dive in today and um, we'll start as always with the WTA tour before going on over to the ATP tour we're going to look at Rome and how everything panned out and also I, uh, the, the other events that have been happening let's say in the background then as well as what's happening this week um, literally mere days away before the French Open is underway and um, I believe that qualifying is actually underway but we won't get into that uh, today we really want to wrap up everything before the French Open commences and then we will take a deep dive into those results next episode all right so 
Before we dive into the top 100, I just wanted to point out WCA Tour, here we come. Two, I think, key rankings that we're looking at is Vidosa, um, 140 in the world. She has regressed 14 places. Uh, we, she has tracked forwards in previous weeks, but this is somewhat of a regression. But we will head on over to uh, her performances later on. The other player noteworthy outside of the top 100 is Asaka. She is up to 134, uh, 39 uh, places she has progressed, which is a significant leap considering um, it was a matter of, say, two weeks ago where she was close to, say, to the top 200 in the world. And it was only a few weeks prior before she broke back into the top 200. So as El how Asaka is tracking, it's looking incredibly likely that after the French, she will uh, crack back into the top 100 and potentially, um, I'm not too sure about Wimbledon, but if she gathers enough points, she is on track to look towards say the US Open and breaking into the top 50, potentially top 30, if she gets some stellar results, um, the next two slams, and we really need to underscore, this is Naomi Osaka. She is incredibly capable of this. And I have been tracking, let's say, her key metrics, these progressions. And while she is not playing at the level she once was, when we're looking at, let's say, key technical parameters, inferences, and her performances she's been able to string together, she has been making some very healthy inroads, some very healthy progressions that does put her on track. Um, the underlying key really is to see if um, Asaka can string together um, enough wins to allow her ranking to, to take shape of what we're looking for. All right, here we go. Uh, top 100. Um, in maybe the later weeks or uh, to come, we will track back, say, to the top 200 again. But I really want to squeeze a lot into today's episode. All right, so on 101, we've got Erica Andreeva. She has slipped outside of the top 100 just at 101. And we will touch on that later. Okay, Kayla Day, she's at 100 in the world the 24 year old from the states okay so we've got a lot of regressions happening inside this ranking range i think the biggest uh, progression is marisova 24 year old from spain she's up 10 places to 94 in the world uh, up 12 places to 90 is Fotova, um 17 year old from um the czech republic that is actually one to watch only 17 years of age she has been one of the youngest players on tour behind erica's sister Andreeva and sh we will get to her ranking shortly okay uh, regressions aggressions um, inside this ranking range so we're looking at some pivotal um, movers number 80 in the world up 30 places is um, Yushijima um, 22 year old from Japan that is a very impressive uh, progression and if this continues to track this is a player to keep an eye on we really do like these key movies uh, Townsend has regressed <coughs> sorry 16 ranking points um, 75 in the world um, let's see we've got Evadassian at 69 in the world Maya Sheriff that's a 28 year old from Egypt she's up 14 places to 66 and she has had a very promising week other noteworthy players around this ranking range. We've got Kvitova. She's up three places to 57 in the world. 59 up two places is Podoroska. Um, other players, we've got Kennan. She's up three to 55. Uh, French is up one to 54, and we'll touch on that shortly. Kokureto is up four to 52 in the world. Pliskova is up one to 51. Lynette is at 50 up one. Schneider is at 15, um, or pro has progressed 15 places to 47 in the world. Noteworthy, uh, she's only 20 years of age, and we will touch on that later, her second title of the season. She has been flying under the radar, but she definitely has been one. We have been tracking 
over the best part of the last four to six weeks. Um, Serenko is at 44, Blinkovas is at 45, Potapova's at 41, Vekic is back three places to 40, Wang's up three to 39. Now, Mira Andreeva is up two places to 38 in the world. Even though her sister is slightly outside or just the top 100, um, Mira Andreeva has been progressing also 17 years of age. That makes two players that I've touched on that are 17 years of age, which is phenomenal. But recall, uh, there are number of posts that I have written and touched on in previous episodes about rapid fire results and the consequences. Why we want players around this ranking range and this age to hover, to reach a performance plateau in a good way. For most players, that is a negative uh, implication of their performance. But if you are, uh, if you're around this age range and you are able to maintain a peak performance that allows you to sit inside the top 100, let alone the top 40 as Mira is doing, you want to hone those skills and really solidify that baseline before progressing too soon. More often than not, what happens is if you do have that rapid fire results at a young age, you will regress shortly after. Now look, the perfect example here is Gorf. When she came onto the scene around 15, 16 years of age, she did not get inside the top 20 overnight. She hovered, she had some really good results, but she hovered then inside the top 50, progressively tracked towards uh, the top 20 before the top 10. And this is what we want to have that healthy trajectory to maintain that top 10 tennis ranking in contrast to regressing and this is uh, in direct correlation with Grand Slam success having Gorf win her maiden slam and she's made uh, Grand Slam finals previously and it's a really a key ingredient to achieve uh, that status or those type of results in contrast to rapid fire so it is a little bit contradictory when we're looking at performance plateaus or that baseline level for a longer period of time but there is a um, an underlying a very important underlying uh, reason for that and that really needs to be highlighted okay Portinsiva is at four places 37 in the world Sloane Stevens is very solid at 35 Sinia is 34 Fernandez is at one at 33 she was inside the top 30 a little bit of a regression the last couple of weeks but remember Layla has been a US Open finalist and she has been doing really well especially in contrast to say Raducanu whose ranking has progressed she really has been um, able to hold her ranking range but we're yet to see uh, a progression beyond this ranking ranges scope. Kudamatova is back six places to 31, so her stay is up two to 30. Nuskova's holding steady, 29. Remember, Australian Open performance. Krejcikova is up one, 26. Now, this is noteworthy because let's remember, uh, Krejcikova has won the French before. So far this season, her performance has not been, let's say, aligning with uh, her Grand Slam status. She obviously was ranked inside the top 10, has regressed outside that ranking range. The best part of the last, say, one to two seasons really has. And she's been uh, inside the top 30 uh, by all means, but has been hovering around here. Um, that said, she's still definitely a dark horse when it comes to the French Open and should not be uh, written off in any way, shape or form. So it'll be really interesting to see how Krejcikova performs. Uh, it could definitely go either way, but her earlier rounds and those performances really will underscore how deep she will go. If she gets past first, second, third round and is really clean, there's more likely for Krejcikova to reach, say, the quarterfinals or later. But there's a lot, I think, at stake in those earlier rounds. Kalin is at 125, Navarro's back 2 to 24. Now, remember, a few weeks ago, uh, Navarro was, I think, around 19 in the world, reached that career high, absolutely sensational, but she has had a little bit of uh, regression 
That said, she is still ranked inside the top 25 in the world. This will be, I think, the first time she will have this type of seeding going into the French. It'll be very interesting to see how Navarro performs. Garcia, steady, 23. Pavlachenko uh, is at back one at 22. Now, let's remember, Pavlachenko is also um, a Grand Slam finalist. Historically, has performed, let's say, reasonably well <laughs> at the French. And this will be very interesting. Um, still to uh, Krejcikova, uh, Pavlachenko has been around for some time now. With those results, we know that she can beat the best in the world on any given day, providing she's playing at that peak level. Um, she did start the season relatively well, has had a little bit of a regression, then progression, so there's a bit of a pattern here which works in her favour leading up into the French. So remember how we've touched on, say, periodization and that planning there. So there is a method to the badness when you see those peaks and then those losses and then those peaks and then those losses if it is planned. Um, whether that is the case is another story. So similar. If Pavlachenkova performs very well in the first, say, two, three rounds, gets her groove, definitely uh, has the potential to progress to the quarters. And let's see those matchups uh, that do occur when it really gets down to the nitty gritty. But Pavlachenkova is one of those players that when it comes to the French, French, you cannot write her off. As a rank is very similar. She's up three places, a 21 in the world, and this is somewhat of a ranking high for her this season. Um, As a rank has not been this high in the rankings, I think for the best part of the last 12 months. That said, she really has been tight and solid inside the top 30, has had some reasonably good results, and she's had some very tough uh, matches where... Uh, uh, she has had that loss. So that said, the, the, a lot of her matches have been very tight. They have not been lopsided in contrast to, say, other players. And some of those players are inside the top 10. Azarenka definitely um, can be and or should be placed inside the top 15 in the world without a doubt with her performance. So it'll be very interesting um, how she racks up and stands against, let's say, some other clay court specialists uh, with literally mere days away. I am excited. Kostchuk, um, she's holding steady at 20. That is her rankings high. Um, Samsonova is back to 19 in the world. Alexandrova has had actually a very good season. 18 in the world, who is steady there. Definitely one to watch. Svitolina's up to 17 in the world. I am looking forward to this because I have lost count how many times Svitolina has made the semifinals of a Grand Slam. It is up there. in the it Definitely um, at least eight, nine times or thereabouts. So we know she's seasoned. That said, I think this is her second um, season back onto a full time now. And last year, was, which was her first one back, she had some really good results. And she's already inside the top 20, or really solidified herself within, I think, nine, to nine months of being back on tour, really hit the ground running. She's been able to maintain this ranking, maintain her performance, which is absolutely phenomenal, correlates with why Asaka is projected to achieve uh, similar heights if she follows a similar trajectory. Uh, French Open Svitolina has performed well, um, on a number of occasions and I'm really rooting for her um, come, come the French to see what she's able to pr uh, perform. She really lucked out with her back at the Australian Open, could have progressed without a doubt to the finals. So this is actually really interesting. Providing Spitalina, she's healthy, her back behaves itself. I don't think she's had any uh, niggles in that respect since uh, when that did happen back in January. So I would absolutely love to see Svitolina make the semifinals. She does not have a slam and is one of the players who is definitely underrated and deserves a slam. I will not be surprised if Svitolina makes the finals and you bet I will be barricading for her. And if it's a Swian Tech Svitolina, that is a tough one. I do not want to pick favorites. That said, uh, Svitolina does not have a slam. She's been around for some time now. Believe it or not, she's only 29 years of age. Um, so that will be incredible. 
incredibly interesting. All right, Keys is at 16, uh, holding steady. Makoba's back one uh, at 15, although she has been inactive. I'm not too sure when she's back on tour, but I believe her, um, her rehab has been going to plan. Her dad, Mayi, is uh, back one. She's 14 in the world. Paolini is back one, just at 13 in the world. She's also at a career high. I mean, she was at 12 in the world. That said, she will be going into the French on an absolute career high. Definitely favorite on clay. Did have that a standout performance at the Australian Open that was a catalyst for this season. So this will be Paolini's first slam since that peak performance, since catalysting her to this ranking high. If she can live up to those expectations, it's going to be very interesting. Whether it's that first, second round, and then falls or progresses all the way through to the round of 16 onwards will be very interesting. All right, this is definitely a big, 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 big favorite. Underscore that is Collins. She's up three places, 12 in the world. She is on the cusp of breaking into the top 10. And I was running some metrics only the other week. And Collins has previously been ranked inside the top 10. We've touched on how she has had her surgeries in the past. I wrote an article, I think it was last week uh, and the week before, that really touched on Colin's um, health issues and how she definitely would have um, latched onto a grand slam if she was at full health. And it's a really, I think, interesting conversation to be had. Um, Nadal, obviously, we know um, with his slams, if he was 100% healthy, of course he would have more slams to his name. And there's a probably um, um, a lot of, I think, arguments to and fro in that respect. We know, and my latest article did touch on this, um, a little bit of a side um, step here, is that Djokovic has been able to maintain his health, which has served him and his Grand Slam success. Federer wasn't able to and eventually and did retire from that. He wasn't able to reach that level again. That said, he was still able to maintain that peak performance. Nadal was somewhat similar and was sidelined when Djokovic was winning those slams. And it's a really interesting conversation um, to touch on. And I'll do it right here and now because let's remember that Djokovic won those handful of slams when he surpassed, say, Nadal, who had just surpassed Federer um, on the Grand Slam count. When those two were not at their peaks, they were not in action, and Sinner and Alcaraz were not in contention yet. They were still climbing their way up to win their maiden slam. Medvedev was the one who was able to get, get in the way but not cause enough problems really interesting conversation because Federer and Nadal had to win their slams against the best in the world the likes of um, one another and Djokovic were on the on the table and so the caliber they had to play was absolutely phenomenal for Djokovic to win those slams the caliber he had to play was not as high it's a very controversial discussion I think um, but how it relates here is when we look at Collins and her health the level of play she's been able to produce in such a short period of time if she's able to maintain that health but unfortunately and we have touched on this endometriosis is um more common it has been getting uh, more uh, notoriety in the sense of a woman's health issue where many women unfortunately do experience the, um, it as a debilitating health issue so for Collins to be able to be ranked 12 in the world let alone reach a Grand Slam final, uh, big ranked inside the top 10 previously. Um, it's really incredible when, when we're looking at, um, let's call it a balancing act for health. And if your health is not optimal and you're still able to reach uh, the finals of a Grand Slam. So it'll be very interesting to see um, how Collins performs at the French. She has had an absolutely stellar year. Um, a rank, it's not a ranking high for her because she's been inside the top 10, but this is definitely um, Collins's uh, first ranking high, I think in the best part of the last say, two seasons. Uh, Kazakina, she is solid at 11, although definitely within reach for Collins to surpass Kazakina if she does not say perform uh, really good, let's say at the French Open, and quite really good, I would love to see Kazakina make the round of 16 or further, which she's incredibly capable of doing, and so is Collins, uh, Collins in her own right. All right, um, into the top 10, uh, Austin Panko. She's had, let's say, a relatively good week. 
I won't say a standout week in contrast to the other 50% of players, but she's still holding steady um, inside the top 10. But all three of Collins, Kazakina, to Austin Penko are within, say, 200 points of one another and being over to either progress and or regress. So we most likely will have a new barrier breaker after the French Open if two out of three really do outperform. However, if Austin Penko goes above and beyond, uh, that will not be the case. Now let's remember as well, Austin Penko has won the French Open before. She's 26 years of age, and I believe she won it when she was a teenager, around 19 years of age, could have been 19, 20 years of age. Had a really big regression after that in the rankings, clawed her way all the way back inside the top 20, eventually inside the top 10, which is really exciting and incredible in equal amounts, although she has not been able to play, let's say, at that Grand Slam uh, peak level since then. Uh, when we're talking about, say, semi-finals, finalists, she hasn't been a finalist of another Grand Slam. So when we're looking um, statistically and we're looking at patterns of play and we're really looking at uh, our predictive analytics, um, we're really looking at that the likelihood of, say, an Austin Penko winning the French, it's, it's, it's not up there. That likewise would say Krejcikova, but you cannot write these players off, especially when they're tracking quite well and absolutely cannot write Austin Penko off when she is holding stronger and steady um, ranked 10 in the world. And she does have some performances to match, more so than other players inside the top 10. When we're looking at other players, Jabor, uh, Zhang, uh, and Pagula are three primary players that really have not been performing at the Grand Slam level this year consistently, or the lead up events. By all accounts, Jabur uh, has reached three Grand Slam finals, I think, in the last two years, um, roughly. So you cannot write her off. However, this season, Jabur's uh, performance, her metrics, do not correlate with the top 10 tennis ranking, uh, without a doubt. And she has suffered very early around losses in contrast to other top 10. So let's say the other 50% of the top 10 and I would say 50% Swiatek, uh, Sabalenka, Gorf, Ripakina and I'm probably going to put Sakari in there um, over say Vondrasova um, from this perspective only because Sakari has been tracking more positively uh, this season um, even though she regressed outside of the top 10 she came back in and really hit the ground running. Um, okay, nine, we, we've touched on Jabur. Um, Zeng is uh, back one to eight. Uh, Zeng's level of play has not been correlating with this newfound ranking high that um, essentially the finalist result at the Australian Open um, really um, springboarded her into the top 10. But that level of play does not correlate with I did touch on her results the other week, which was the best I've seen her play since the Australian Open. So it'll be actually very interesting to see how Zeng performs um, next week and if she's able to make the second week of a Grand Slam again. Or for, um, she has been able to previously at the US Open before the Australian Open, but this will be very interesting, especially on the Grand Slam stage and having reached the finals of the Australian Open. She most very well could fly under the radar, but granted her results over the last uh, couple of weeks, and then when I say couple of weeks, the last probably uh, 12 um, weeks, 12 even to 16 weeks, that level of play has not been up there when we're looking at that other 50%. Vodra is over steady. She actually has lifted her game um, in the last couple of weeks. So we also know Vondra Sova holds that grand slam. And so it was incredibly deserving. So, and that's why even though I put Sakari ahead of Vondra Sova in that 50%, it's really fluctuate because um, in hindsight, we've got 50% of the women with a grand slam. Vondra Sova, Rubikina, Gulf, Sadalenka, Sweetie. Pagula has not reached a final. Sakari has not reached a final. Austin Penko actually has won. So I need to correct myself. That's 60%. And I think it's, it's often forgotten because Austin Penko's slam was some time ago now, which is really incredible when we contrast towards, um, let's say, the ATP Tour. Jabor has made three finals. Zeng has made a final, which means Sakari and Pagula 
are the only players who have not reached a Grand Slam final. Now, if that is not a phenomenal statistic, I don't know what is. If you have 80% of players inside the top 10 who have reached a Grand Slam final, let alone 60% who have at least one Grand Slam to their name, this is incredibly well-deserving. Now, the one player who was outside the top 10 who could contribute here is Collins, who was also a Grand Slam finalist. I would love to see that because if Collins cracks into the top 10 and let's say Pagula and or Sakari regresses back out, you will have uh, 90% of players inside the top 10 having made a final or won a Grand Slam at least once. And that is so much depth in contrast to uh, the ATP Tour. Women's tennis is in a really solid place. All right, um, to wrap up these rankings, Pagula's um, sitting um, at five. She's actually well ahead of Vondrasova, who's behind her. There's 500 points um, that separate the two. And ahead then is Ribikina. And you have over a 1,000 points separating, let's say, um, Ribikina from Pagula. The top four are really ahead of themselves. Gorf is oof, another 2,000 points ahead of Ribikina. That actually says a lot. Even though Ribikina's metrics um, are almost parallel with Swiatek's this season, her level of play and her results, she's been able to accomplish. I think the points then again speak for themselves, given that Gorf is 2,000 points ahead. Uh, Sabalank is roughly ooh, uh, that, that four 500 points uh, ahead of Gorf, and Swiatek is way out there. I think that's roughly around 3,000 um, points that separate them, even a little bit more than that. Um, given the French, if Gorf makes the finals of the French, the she will come, I think, very close to Sabalenka. However, granted how Sabalenka has been playing, it's going to be a bit difficult. Ribikina making the finals is also incredibly likely. However, it uh, looks like when we uh, look at the rankings and their points, that probably will not move. The top five will not move um, their points wise. However, Vondrasova could potentially overtake Pagula by all accounts, but those top four um, are pretty solid. Um, seven and eight definitely have the chance, as well as nine and 10 are relatively close. However, there's still around, let's say 400 points separating nine and 10, but the French Open is definitely has the capacity for a bit of a shuffle. All right, let's head straight into Madrid. I've been looking forward to this um, all week and it's Rome, it is not Madrid because these do are so back to back and it is clay court season, I um, so I do apologize. All right, Rome, last week we touched on the first and second rounds. So let's dive into the third round and head from there. All right, Swiatek, Putinsiba, three and four to Swiatek. Then we had Kerber over Sasnovich. That was straight sets. Uh, second set tie break, that was tight. Um, Haddad Mahia fell to keys, a very good win to keys in three sets. Vondra Sova, however, she did fall to Sestaya, and this is what kind of underscores her ranking. Despite being that Grand Slam champion, has she been progressing consistently um, in, in contrast so to the others? And she has been falling short, let's say, more often than those other, say, primary four. Okay, Gorv and Christian, um, three sets, look at this, 6-1, love 6-6-3. Six, six, what follows here, and despite Bedosa's ranking pro, um, regression recently, she did get that win over Schneider. Now remember, Schneider just won her second title of the season. So this is in fact a really good win for Bedosa. So her ranking actually does not correlate with her performance, which is a good sign for her, because if Bedosa can string together a handful of wins at the French, she is positioned quite possibly to progress back into the top 100, possibly the top 80, depending if she's able to make, say, the third, fourth round. But she definitely has that capacity, especially given this performance against Schneider, who has, well, no, Schneider is definitely on, let's say, a peak uh, trajectory and heading towards the top 50. So Bedosa, despite that rankings regression, um, there is positive signs from this result. 
Asaka over Kazakina. Now this underscores why Asaka has essentially leapfrogged back inside the top 150 and um, having defeated Kazakina, number 11 in the world, three and three, really positions Osaka not only with the potential capacity to be based inside uh, the top 20 again, it really positions her to more consistently and steadily um, reach, uh, I would say, the top 30 by year's end. Uh, Noskova felt a Zeng. This was a very good performance from Zeng. Uh, and, and this is essentially what I've been underlying about. No, Zeng has not been, um, her performance has not been aligning uh, with that top 10 ranking up until now. She had a very good result and her next round's even better. So we'll get to that shortly. Sakari over Kalanina. 766 six slot. So when we're looking at Sakari progressing here and Vondrasova not, these are let's say the micro discrepancies that edge Sakari in front of Vondrasova despite Vondrasova having a grand slam to her name. As a ranker over Sheriff, Sheriff has progressed in the rankings, uh, rightly so, but this is why as a ranker deserves to be ranked high because this was a very challenging match, but still as a ranker progressed and even more so in the next round, which we'll touch on shortly. All right, Collins over Garcia, a very good win, three and three. Uh, Merchants fell to Bagu. 2 and 0. Oh. Kenan Felter, Shemankova in three sets. Austin Penko, a very good win over Sorobez Tormo, 6 4, 5 7, 6 1. Svitolina over Kalinskaya, 3 and 3. Um, Sabalenka, a very good win over Yastremska, 4 and 2. All right, we'll go backwards um, from the rounds. Here we go. Sabalenka, a very good win over Svitolina. This definitely could have gone either way, but look at this scoreline. 4 6 6 1 7 6. So you're looking at that third set tiebreak. This is why Svitolina has the capacity, especially on clay, to go all the way. Considering we know Sabalenka made the final, just fell short, Swiatek was too good. And we will get to that. I'm trying not to get ahead of myself. Svitolina really does have it in her to progress further. All right, next up we've got Austin Penko over Shaman Kova. Um, this was tight three sets, four six, six four. Seven six. That's really impressive. But it also showcases that yes, Austin Penko got through, but it can be close, and that is why she's not let's say favored um, to progress past the round of sixteen. That said, if Austin Penko makes the round of sixteen, I will be very impressed, and her metrics uh, will be a lot more positive, and potentially um, room to for that quarterfinals berth. Right, Collins over Pagu. Six love six. Three, really underscoring that rankings progression. As a ranker over Sakari, this is what underscores um, as a ranker's capacity and why I marked her to be ranked inside the top 15 in the world, but also Sakari falling next round in contrast to Vondrasuva. And, and that is why both of them are very tightly aligned when we're looking at rankings and those progressions. Okay, we've got uh, Zeng over Asaka, 6-2-6-4. Definitely Zeng's best match since the Australian Open, making the finals there, because we have not seen this level of play. And granted, Asaka beat uh, Kazakina in the previous round. This is a really solid performance from Zeng. Okay, Gorf over Bedosa. This was a stellar match. And I'll say why, because not only are we looking at the round of 16 in Rome, Gorf is absolutely at a peak, at home on clay. Bedosa's ranking, despite it regressing, she just beat um, a player who's won two titles this year, and she's taking Gorf to three sets. Five, seven, six, four, six, one. And that's why I think Bedosa is actually on the right track. We just need her to stay healthy. Keys over, so stay at two and one. 
followed by Swiatek, a very good win over Kerber, 7563. And I think it goes without saying, um, watching how Swiatek has been playing, it's been really exciting and rewarding. And Kerber definitely put up a fight in that first set. And it's similar, um, I think they met around the Australian Open or shortly thereafter. And it was really close as well in one set. Um, but that's actually a promising result. It'll be very interesting to see how Kerber um, tracks come the French Open potentially has uh, that round of 16 in her I'm not going to be surprised if it's that third round stage and remember this is Kerber's first full season um, back after becoming a mum and that's that we know that's the case for Osaka as well Spitalina's um, was two seasons ago and I know there's a number of other women on tour who are first time mums and I think it's incredibly exciting to see the level of play they are delivering and I think it's incredibly underrated the work that goes into recovering and then being a professional athlete, reaching this level of play, it really is remarkable. All right, quarterfinal stage, Swiatek over Keys, one and three. That is brutal, but a stellar performance from Swiatek. Gorf over Zeng, really good, seven, six, six, one. Look at that first set, look how close it was, and then that second set, six, one. And now that's a really big differential from, say, the top three in the world to, say, the other top 10 in the world. And um, how, let's say, Zeng um, compares, um, when we're looking at the best level of play, especially I'm going to pinpoint those three from Gorf, Sablenka, Swiatek. All right, Collins, look at this. Over Azarenka, 6-4, 6-3. That is a stellar result. Um, then Sabalenka over Austin Penko, 2-4. And, and let's remember again, Austin Penko's number 10 in the world. She has won the French um, before, a number of years ago now, but Sabalenka was just too good, two and four, and that's why I'm not too sure if Austin Penko can go all the way again if players of this caliber um, stand in Austin Penko's way. Um, I never want to write a top 10 player off, absolutely not. Same goes for a lot of other players, but, uh, but when we're looking at the data and the predictive analytics, the, um, they highly favor the likes of Sega Sabalenka in contrast to Austin Penko. Next round, this was tied. I thought this one was going to potentially go to three sets. Semi-finals though, and Collins showed up. She is in the semi-finals. Sablanka, it was seven, five, six, two. Both of these players have been playing so much tennis over the last couple of weeks, but that's a really um, impressive result, especially I'm going to say for Sabalenka. Other semi-finals, definitely thought this was going to go three sets. I was um, very nervous and somewhat surprised that Swiatek really did bring it home over Gorf, 6-4-6-3. That is a standout result, especially given how well Gorf can play on play and how she's been tracking. And this really does edge Swiatek over the rest because the final, we know that score line, Swiatek, Sabalenka, 6-2, 6-3. And when we're considering it was only, uh, let's say 10 days ago, or two weeks-ish ago, where Sabalenka had championship point against uh, Swiatek in Madrid. But for Swiatek to go back to back, it really is absolutely phenomenal. All right, let's quickly go over to um, the Palmer Open. Now, it did finish um, a couple of days ago, but it's still noteworthy to look at, let's say, um, the quarterfinals and onwards. So here we've got um, Zarazua over Stearns, four and four. Um, Sheriff over Rakimova, um, three and five. And this is why I wanted to highlight some of these progressions um, in the players' rankings to some of the other tournaments that have also been underway. Schmidl over, over Mackler over, um, six love, seven, five. Um, Naima over Somaz, three and five. Semi-finals, uh, we did have Zarazua over Sheriff. And the result here is really interesting because we know how um, Zarazua has been showing up, but we also know how Sheriff has been noted with that rankings progression. So we've got four and four to Sheriff. In the other half, we've got Schmidl over, over Naima, three sets to make the final. That was six, four, six, seven, and that was 11 in that tie break, seven, five. And Schmidlova did progress over Sheriff, so Schmidlova has secured that title. Seven, five, two, six, six, four. But it's also why we're want to, or we want to keep an eye on both of those players and how they are tracking. All right, um, 
Paris and the trophy at Carins has been on. So let's again start at the quarterfinal stage and go through these results. We've got Navarro number one seed over Kessler one and two, and um, Ferro over Busca three and seven six. Uh, Gadecki um, fell to Cornet uh, six four four six six three. Uh, Roos over Mladenovic uh, one and O. Oh. Schneider over Jackie Mo um, three sets. Um, Harry fell to um, Erica Andreeva, uh, five and five. Uh, Gracheva, Volnets, three sets, and Balta got a win over Tomova in straight sets. At uh, quarterfinals, um, Gracheva um, over Balta in straight sets. Then Schneider, straight sets over Andreeva, one and two. Cornet fell to Roos, uh, six one, six two. Navarro um, got a win over Ferro, three and two. All right, let's get to the semi-finals now. We had Navarro over Ruse, O and two. Um, Schneider over Brachiva, four and two. And look at this result. We've touched on how Navarro was at a rankings peak a few weeks ago. It's still 22 in the world, um, ish. Very solid. Schneider has been tracking forward and to get her second title of the season, three sets. Schneider, six, two, three, six, six, four. Schneider just beat essentially a player who was ranked inside the top. 20 a matter of weeks ago really tracked Schneider very promising to potentially break into the top 30 definitely this season if she continues tracking so definitely our metrics have been adding up and corresponds with a player definitely to watch all right Strasbourg is underway that's the bigger tournament um, going on this week so it's only early on so we've only got a couple of matches to report on we've got French over Stevens three and three first round um, Maria Andreeva um, fell to um, Ferrero two and two Kalanina over Pavlichenka but that is actually a very big win for Kalanina three um, six three three six six four Potenceva felt as Sidniakova. Now we've just touched on Sidniakova's performance, so this is not as surprising. Six love, seven five. Uh, Burrell over Pliskova in three sets. That second set was six love, third set six one. Svitolina over Parry straight sets. Um, Alexandra over, over Buska six love seven five. Lynette over Sestaya five and five. Wang over Kalinskaya. Four and six. That's a very good win for Wayne. Um, other matches we've got Krejcikova falling to Samsonova. So three sets though, but it's a first round. Um, so it kind of let's say uh, hits away at Krejcikova's potential progressions. Come the French with Samsonova with a really solid three set win there. Fernandez over Potapova three sets. Navarro over Cornet, four and one. Remembering it was only last week Navarro did make the finals there and fell to Schneider that we touched on a short time ago. All right, we've only got a couple of um, second round matches, which really are the round of 16 to touch on. We've got Fernandez over Samsonova. Um, sorry, it was Samsonova with the win over Fernandez. That was four, six, six, four, six, two. Um, that's the only uh, second round match or round of 16 match that has been underway. And we've got one more to wrap up on the WJ before we head on over to the ATP tour. So we do have um, the Grand Prix in Morocco that did, uh, well it is underway right now. So we've just got a couple of first round matches predominantly to touch on. Uh, Ros Rosatello over Yuan in three sets and Yuan was the number one seed. So Rosatello is a very impressive win. That was 7-6-1-6-6-4. Let's see how far she ends up um, progressing. Um, Rakim over over Townsend. Two love. Townsend did retire. Uh, Day fell to Bay. Straight sets. Kokureto over um, Kabjar. Um, three and four. Sorobez Tormo over Dart in straight sets. Podoroska over Maria straight sets. Um, Sheriff over um, El Alui, um, two and one. Uh, Kala over Rus, three and three. Uh, Wang over Brenna Chiado, um, straight sets. Stearns over Krunik, three sets. Woo! Trevons over Hibino in three sets. Bronzetti over um, El Alami, um, one and O. Oh. Wang over Zhu, three sets there. And Tom. Tom over over Zangig in straight sets. Um, Osorio over Evanasian. That was three sets. However, four love up. Osorio was Evan Evan 
Evanassian retired. I'm a big fan of players that finishing off their matches, so I hope um, it was a brutal uh, and they could not finish. Uh, if a player is unwell, I really do like to see them finish off, especially if they're early on in their career, just to set that example. And I think when we're looking at the likes of, say, um, a Federer or a Nadal historically, uh, they only retired, I think, if they were drastically unwell. Um, that's just food for thought. All right, Seidman over Blinkova in straight sets. Um, we've only got, I think it was one match-ish that has um, a second round. We've got two second rounds, which is the round of 16. Sorabez Tormo over Podoroska in three sets and Kokureto over Bay four and two. That really wraps up the women's tour. And I really want to apologize as always if I have mispronounced your name. Um, there is an incredibly high um, likelihood that that has been the case. So I remember that it does happen. So I really do apologize. All right, that really wraps up um, the WTA tour. There was a lot to, I think, unpack there. So it's really time now to head on over to the ATP tour and dive into the rankings. Okay, starting at top 100, we've got Botic Van, De Van, <laughs> Botic Van De Zan Schulp. He's up 12 places to 100 in the world. Van De Zan Schulp actually has had heightened progressions um, over, I want to say, the last couple of seasons. So much so that he has previously been on the radar. So moving up 12 places to be 100 in the world is a very good progression for him. Well, Rinka has regressed 10 places to 97. Um, I think the French Open will be very interesting how he performs. Let's remember he's 39 years of age. He is going strong. I would love to see Stan um, reach the round of 16. I'm not too sure if he still has it in him. That said, I will never write uh, well, Rinka up. He, we know he has won, I believe, yes, the, the French Open previously, even though it was a number of years ago now. Uh, well, Rinka really knows how to play on clay and I think it'll be really interesting um, how that unfolds. Berrettini's back one at 96 in the world, another former top 10 player. He's made uh, the finals of a Grand Slam previously, so it's um, really disheartening to see these players at this ranking range. However, we know that they've dealt with injuries, they've had their blows, but look, they are still holding strong. I think on any day of the week, they are formidable opponents. I would love to see both, well, Rinka and Berrettini and he performed really well at the French. However, uh, no, there is no corresponding data with that. It's really just a heartfelt, it would be great to see these players progress further. All right, um, noteworthy players. Muller's up 19 places to 19 in the world. Shang is up 16 places, 89 in the world, 19 years of age from China. And I think this is the highest rank um, Chinese male player um, ever, if not recently. But I believe I did read something recently that this is the, the highest and youngest um, Chinese male player to have cracked into the top 100, let alone be ranked 89 in the world. So um, despite all of that, it'll be very interesting to see how Shang um, tracks and how he progresses, given he's only 19 years of age. And if he continues this type of trajectory, he very well could finish, I think, the year's end inside the top 50, if not higher. But given that he's just on our radar now, having cracked into the top 100 just uh, this week, Let's see how his performance at the French unfolds and if he's able to maintain a ranking around this range and progress uh, steadily. Um, Hackman is back 26 places at 85 in the world and it was only the other week he won that title. Or he won the title, I believe it was, made the finals. Um, he really, I think, um, does have it in him. Yes, he did win the, um, the final. Um, but this is actually a very big hit, back 26 places. I'd really like to see Halfman progress forwards, irrespective of his 32 years of age, um, showing that he has been able to win a title um, now, later in his career. Um, definitely places Halfman should progress. Let's hopefully see that the third round at the French would be really good for his ranking, but also let's say correlate with his recent um, performances. 
Uh, the A game Montero is up 22 places to 84 in the world. Um, Karatz is um, up 4 to 82. Daniel's up 1 to 80. Um, Bogusta, a good, um, he was former top 10 player. He's up 5 places to 80 in the world. Murray's up 2 to 75. We know he's been um, a lot higher. Murray again, grand slams multiple to his name. 37 years of age. Would love to see a great performance from Murray at the French. Um, Menzik, 76, he's back um, 11 places and Kazook's back 2 to 77 in the world. Other noteworthy players around this ranking range. Nishioka is up eight places at 72 in the world. Korich is back 16, 71 in the world. Nadi is up 11 places, 70 in the world. Kori is up 5, 69 in the world. Nakashima is up 4, 68 in the world. Kofa's are back 15, 67 in the world. Um, other big jumpers that are noteworthy around this range. We've got Evans is up seven places, 60 in the world. Diego said both Wilds up three places, uh, 58 in the world. Um, tracking forward now inside the top 50, uh, we've got uh, Sanegro is up th um, back three places, sorry, 50 in the world. Dardere is up seven places, 47 in the world. Borges is up seven places, 46 in the world. Um, Zhang is up 14 places, uh, 42 in the world. So I think this is a very interesting statistics here. We've just touched on Shang. So I'm going to say Shang is the youngest ever Chinese player to be ranked inside the top 100 because Zhang, he's 27 years of age and he's from China. So I think that article that um, was shared there's a little bit of a bias there potentially so Shane's definitely got to be on that younger scale there but Zhang is definitely tracking irrespective but 27 years of age he's at 14 places 42 in the world let's see how the French unfolds because 14 is a very good progression uh, Leonard Struff's up two places to 39 in the world. Monfils is holding steady at the th um, 38 in the world. You can never write uh, Monfils off at the French Open. It would be sensational to see a really good performance. Fancy a quarterfinals um, showing from Monfils. We know he's been there before. Um, I don't think it's been for a number of seasons now, but uh, Gail is absolutely sensational to watch. I'd love to see him back in action at that higher level of play. Does the data or the metrics that correspond with that result they do not um, I'm touching on a lot of heartfelt ones here because we do have players that have been ranked inside the top 10 who have regressed uh, on the back half of the top or towards close towards the top 100 uh, in contrast towards close to the top 10 so these players would be really exciting to see that type of hurrah there all right Phil's is at 30 in the world um, he's up four places quarters back one 28 in the world um to billows up 725 in the world we know he has had a stand out week um, Manorino is at 22 in the world so he is up one place there. Um, Felix um, Ogul Alissime, uh, he's back one, he's 21 in the world, but let's remember he's just cracked back inside um, the top 20, but he, yeah, 21, but let's say really close around or thereabouts, but he had been struggling for some time to uh, break there. All right, Jari, he's had a standout week as well. He's up eight places, 16 in the world. Shelton's back one, 15, Paul's up two, 14, Rune's back one, 13. We've touched on why this regression will potentially continue. Fritz is up one to 12 in the world. Um, Demore is holding steady. There's 400 points-ish separating Dimonor and Fritz. Hoping Dimonor has a really good showing um, this French Open. He definitely has it in him to reach, let's say, I'm, oh, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say definitely round of 16, potentially quarterfinals. Not too sure with um, Alex's um, current level of play at the moment. If um, it will align with a quarterfinals or later. But remember, Alex already has a title to his name this season, which essentially pinpoints that Alex cannot be written off. There's definitely scope for Alex to progress. However, I'm going to teach Ron round of 16, potentially quarterfinals if there's an absolute peak there. We know that he's fallen to Nadal, um, but I do believe he got that win against Nadal as well. So, so 
Demino has that game, um, whether or not he can string enough uh, wins together um, later on in the second week um, of a Grand Slam will be really interesting to see, especially I want to say this season since the Australian Open performance peaks with that um, additional title to his name and if that I think um, is something that really does unfold over the, uh, the next fortnight. Alright, um, top 10 um, has not changed. Dimitrov is pretty steady, 10 in the world. There's only 200 points ish separating the two, which really underscores that um, after the French Open unfolds, potentially there could be a shuffle if Dimitrov does progress over, say, the likes of Dimitrov and Tsitsipas, which are, uh, let's say, closely behind or within that, say, three to four um, hundred point range. Um, so Tsitsipas is actually at nine in the world. He has regressed just one point, um, which is a little bit surprising because we know he made those two finals has that title to his name, and he progressed um, more than Rudd um, in Rome. Um, Herkax is at one point to eight in the world, and Rudd is actually steady at seven in the world, which again is a little bit contradictory considering um, the fluctuation in results. It is noteworthy, however, Tissipas did regress along with Rudd outside the top 10. Tissipas only briefly, Rudd managed to progress inside the, um, the top 10 once again this season. Tissipas was only outside side for I want to say a matter I think it was around two weeks ish. Rudd however did begin uh, more of a peak performance earlier on this season in contrast to Tissipas um, which essentially um, highlights where those additional points have come from but Tissipas really with his recent level of play um, should be ranked ahead of Rudd. That said when we're really correlating I think both tours it's a very interesting discussion but let's cap this off. Rublev is at six in the world. He's actually been picking up his performance after a slight lull the last couple of weeks. Um, Medvedev is back one to five in the world. I think this is ironically the lowest Medvedev has been ranked in some time now. And I say ironically because it is five in the world. Zarev is up one to four in the world. This is, I think, Zarev's highest ranking since coming back from that, uh, let's say, disastrous ankle injury a number of seasons ago now. So his stellar rise back inside the top 10 was astonishing. And to reach this level, come the French Open, Zarev is definitely um, in contention. Uh, I will not um, provide commentary on what's happening outside the tennis court. That is a very um, uh, different story, but I will just stick to the metrics um, for uh, today. Uh, but that is very noteworthy of off court and whether um, Zarev, I suppose, should be allowed or eligible to play. Alcaraz, we know, hasn't been in action this week. Sina hasn't been in action this week. Djokovic did lose early on in Rome. Rome. All right, we know Djokovic has, got a, has a number of slams to his name. 24, going for 25, absolutely sensational. Track back to that earlier conversation around the likes of Nadal and Federer with those slams and why Djokovic was able to capitalize on that gap um, because Senna and Alcaraz had not shown up. They were not in contention. Zarev was not in contention for a slam. Even though he was at that level of play, Zarev has only made one final. Uh, Medvedev definitely was in contention, but he was not able to um, really um, take it, I'll say, to Djokovic uh, on a consistent basis. This is followed by um, Rublev. Then we've got Rudd, um, Herkax, Tizipas, and Dimitrov. Dimitrov has not made a slam final. Tisipas has made a slam final before. Herkax has made a slam final before. Rudd has made a slam final before. Rublev has not. Medvedev has won more than one slam final before. Zarev has made one slam final before. Look at this. Alcaraz has won a slam. Sinner has won a slam now. And Djokovic has won a slam. And look at that. If you track back to the women's tour and the men's tour ironically in a really good way that is also 80% of players there is a direct correlation which is very interesting so if we look at who's on the cusp um, Collins was on the cusp to potentially take that to um, 90% there are no players inside the top 15 who have made a final of a Grand Slam uh, which puts um, edges the WTA tour's depth 
ahead of these players um, especially when we are uh, looking at the dispersion um, there very interesting statistic very noteworthy uh, I got a little bit ahead earlier on thinking potentially these metrics are going to be a little bit lower but we know Tissipas has made the slams final um, previously Hercax as well and Rudd Rudd has been very consistent with those finals ahead of Tissipas um, in that fact Medvedev, by all accounts, we know he's up there. Senna, Elkras, slams through the name. Djokovic, absolutely, of course. But it's actually Zarev who I, let's say I uh, forgot, had made that US Open final a number, a number of seasons ago now. I think he actually would have been the favourite over theme, but that was um, that's another conversation there. Um, given that the French is going to be themes last, theme has slipped outside of the top 100. I believe he's around 130 one in the world at this stage I also believe he has qualified for the French uh, fingers crossed he definitely deserves um, one last hurrah but that's um, another conversation but let's head we'll, we'll leave that for when the French happens next week and is in full swing underway uh, this time next week and it, yeah it's only a couple of days away so again very excited trying not to get sidetracked okay three events to wrap up we're going to start with Rome because there is so much to unpack similar to the women's tour because let's dive right in now we had Djokovic and Tabillo um, third round now in Tabillo this is where we got that win two and three Correlated with that rankings progression, very um, impressive. Let's see how Djokovic tracks at the French because we do not have the data that we typically would have tracking Djokovic to be favoured there. You can never write Djokovic off, let alone at a Grand Slam. Absolutely not. Does Djokovic have it in him to win uh, the French Open? Of course he does. I don't think anyone uh, sane, uh, irrespective if they have access to the numbers or not, is capable of writing him off even though it potentially is a, a slight um, anomaly because he hasn't been tracking um, as progressive as some other players say Sinner and Elka, Elkaraz even Medvedev and Zarev Tissipas and Rad have all had and Herkax and Dimitrov um, and Rublev have all had more promising starts this season than Djokovic he's actually the one player um, inside the top 10 who has not had um, inroads this season and that is a phenomenal statistic we I don't think we've ever seen that before since Djokovic has been based in the top 10 that said we hold Djokovic to such an incredibly high standard with 24 slams to his name. We definitely did the same to Nadal, Federer, to Serena. But this is um, very different because we know there's um, a new wave of players, a very big generational gap change here. Um, and Djokovic has not been able to keep pace this season. So we're going to see, I think, one of two things, a continued regression. Um, it's going to be a while before that ranking um, shuffles let's say outside the top three because Sina really is poised to potentially um, get that number one ranking if Djokovic um, falls short at the French and Sina progresses um, so again it's very interesting seeing the next two weeks unfold at the French Open um, but it's a bit also a very interesting conversation when we're looking at every player at the moment inside the top 10 has had a, a better season or better start to the season than Djokovic um, and that's only looking at some key numbers or some, um, um, some of the data that does not showcase let's say the whole story but still it's an embarrassing very important part of what's been unfolding so far especially the best part of the last say um three to five months all right um third round uh next match we've got Surulundo fell to uh Kakanikov in straight sets Shelton fell to Zhang in straight sets that was an interesting one um Montiero um progressed three sets over Kekmanovic Zurev over Darderi um seven six six two 
Borges over Passaro at uh, three sets, four, six, seven, six, seven, six. Wow. Fritz over quarter, three and four. Dimitrov over Altamay at straight sets. Tissipas over Nori. Good win, six, two, seven, six. A gore Alissime fell to Dimonor. Very tight. Look at this, seven, six, six, four, six, four. Wow. Jerry over Molotano, uh, three sets. Rublev fell very early. Um, he won that title last week, uh, or it was the week before. I don't have that in front of me, but Rublev has actually had some promising results the last uh, few weeks. Um, good, but look at this with um, Muller, who qualified uh, three sets over Rublev. Um, Herkex over Echeverry in straight sets. Rune fell to Bayez, uh, really solidifying why he's um, been progress or regress sorry outside the top 10 the last i think it's been around four to five weeks now uh paul over copa a uh, straight set and medvedev three set win over medjovic um paul over medvedev in the second uh sorry in the round of 16 that was um very surprising um that, yes unexpected uh, by all accounts but that was six one six four uh paul really has been tracking forwards this season i believe he already has a title to his name really been quietly progressing um, a little bit loudly in a really good way which um this is potentially the first Grand Slam Paul is going into where he is considered potentially a round of 16 contender and let's see what happens because if he's able to beat Medvedev um, on clay, even though Medvedev is not a clay court specialist, he's still been able to string those wins together. So it's a very good win for Paul and I am not going to write him off. I will not be surprised if Paul makes the quarterfinals of the French. All right, Herkax over Bayez in three sets um jerry over Mueller, um, five and three. Uh, this is a good win for Tissipas over Diminor, six, one, six, two. Very impressive. And why uh, Tissipas' ranking should have been uh, in front of, or at, uh, Rudd's and Tissipas should have been interchanged. But then again, we're looking at uh, the period of play over the last, say, four to six weeks. Rudd nudges ahead just a fraction. Diminor, though, to go one and two to Tissipas, that's a bit brutal. Um, Fritz over Dimitrov in three sets. That's a very impressive win for Fritz and why he's tracking slightly forwards, um, especially with this type of win over Dimitrov. Zarev over Borges, uh, two and five. Zhang over Montiero, um, straight sets. Tabilo over Kakanikov, um, seven, six, seven, six. A quarter finals uh, to Billow over Zhang, three and four. Zarev over Fritz, four and three. Tisipas fell to Jari, a very good win for Jari, three sets. And Herkex fell to Paul, three sets. A very good win also for Paul, really underscoring how well Paul has been progressing. All right, semi final stage. We've got Zarev in three sets over to Billow, but look at this one, six, seven, six, six, two. Wow. And then Jari over Paul, really impressive, six, three. Six seven six three. Very impressive. I don't think Chilean tennis has been this well represented for some time now. Uh, I think it was Garin was ranked inside the top 20 um, two, three seasons ago. He's regressed around the top 100 in the world, thereabouts. Um, Tabillo and Jari, though, both players now ranked inside not only to the top 30 but i think recalling um our discussion on rankings a short time ago now both of these players definitely inside the top 20 at new rankings high very impressive zarev did get that title over jerry six four seven five and this is really underscoring why zarev is one to watch um come the french open all right round of 16 let's start off oh, the uh, geneva open that is currently under away we've got a couple of matches we can touch on uh round of 32 so first round here here we go Hafman over murray uh seven five six two shapovalov a good win over korea seven five six love eubanks fell to greek and sport in three cents um Kovacivic, um over um fell to sorry mitchelson in three sets uh goffin qualified but he fell to monero de alboran another qualifier two and one drake Felt a Macaque 7661. Shabenko over Marazan 6476. Um, um, Rusabori over Giron 3 and 3. Kaboli over Karatsev 5 and 1. 
Nagar Felt of Bayes, 7663. A Carabella Bayena of Eltima, uh, 7664. Um, Ofna over uh, Rinki, uh, three sets. Um, and that really rounds out the first round matches. We've got a couple of matches that we can touch on in the second round. Um, only one actually that has been finished. And that was Kaboli, a very good win over Shelton, who got a bye in the first round, uh, 4 6 7 6 6. Six, three. Um, th that's all the matches currently that have been played um, at the Geneva Open, but that is not really a promising sign for Shelton leading into the French Open. That said, Shelton actually did win um, the Green Clay um, event a, a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not going to write him off. Absolutely not. That was actually also a very interesting discussion. Potentially, Shelton has it in him to make the round of 16, going off ranking he should make the round of 16 going off his performance a month ago he should make the round of 16 going off his recent results if we're looking at Rome and the Geneva Open potentially second third round um, so it's a little bit questionable all right the last match we've got is um, the Parrick Open in France uh, a couple of matches only the first round really has been underway um Kofa over Barano Cassano a lucky loser that was three sets say both wild over Martinez straight sets a Chevry three sets over Sanchez is Quil Do I really do apologize for the mispronunciation Daveri over Daniel who qualified that's in straight sets um Rinda Net over Evans in three sets TFO good win over uh Muna in straight sets Nishioka over um Fans hello, a lucky loser, straight sets there. Um, Sinegro fell to Mitichej uh, Perdicard, a wild card there. Very good win for him. Um, Gaston over Galan, 7 uh, 6 7 6. Kotov over Kashin, uh, 1 and 4. Muller over Gasquet, 4 and 4. Be very interesting to see how Gasquet performed at the French Open. Also, if he's granted a wild card, which I believe he needs because of his ranking. Not too sure um, where his ranking is sitting. I did not see him inside the top 100, although I could have skipped him unintentionally. But Gasquet is always a pleasure to watch on clay and it's always a lot of fun, um, especially with that one-hander. All right, Vukic over McDonald, two and two. All right, we've only got, um, I think, two or three matches to that have gone underway in the second round, which is the round of 16 here. Bublik over Vucic, um, four and two. Uh, very good win for Bublik. He has actually been progressing this season and I think this is his career high ranking at this stage. Um, moving on from the Australian Open. So this will actually be his highest seeding, I believe, at a Grand Slam. Uh, it'll be very interesting if he tracks uh, past the round of 16 or not. I wouldn't be surprised if Bullock makes the round of 16, but let's see what happens from there. And uh, Kotov over Muller, 7 6 6 one. All right, that wraps up all of the matches. It's a really long one today, a bit longer, I think, than anticipated. Um, but we did have a lot to, to cover, and hopefully you will not hear it once this um, does go live. But I do have... Um, and two sidekicks with me all the time um, and they did potentially um, have a bit of a bark at the mailman um, <laughs> during um, our live recording but I do love them dearly and I do try my best to get them to behave themselves which they mostly do most episodes all right I really want to wrap up today's episode we've touched on the results of Rome really impressive we've looked at some of the players um, specifically I really want to emphasize um, um, the top 10, 80% of players on the W chain ATP tours have made that final or have won a Grand Slam previously. However, when we're looking at the metrics, there's a lot more depth um, currently on the WTA tour um, when we're looking at that level of competitiveness. But also, let's really run home on the ATP Tour top 10. We really have some key movers who have started to perform um, the last couple of weeks, which is really good to see. And I think uh, considering the French Open and it is coming, uh, top 10 tennis rankings, there is going to be a shuffle. And let's remember also the eight keys. And I tell you what, the player who solidifies the eight keys more so in their game 
come the French Open, we are going to see uh, those top 10 tennis rankings really come to life and solidify uh, that correlation and the work inside how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking. The French Open is definitely one to watch, uh, especially tracking towards that top 10 tennis ranking. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I really hope you enjoyed, let's say that finale um, on really running home those top 10 tennis rankings. And I'm trying to wrap up today's episode with those two sidekicks that normally behave themselves, but today's been a little bit of a different story. Uh, believe it or not, um, <laughs> they are both in my arms as I'm wrapping up today's episode. So look, to grab your copy of uh, my new release, How to Develop a Top 10 Tennis Ranking, um, head on over to AIMA International or head to Amazon, irrespective where you're based in the world. And hey, get it in time for the French Open and you really will be able to, one, track players' progressions a lot more closely. Or if you are in the main draw and you want to gain that edge to nudge closer towards that top 10, 10 tennis ranking post French Open, make that chance, make the round of 16 and make those inroads. It's definitely one to get your hands on and also catch up on our episodes here. Uh, for any comments or questions, head to AIMA International or Topic Thread, the show social platform set on data privacy. To interact with Beyond Top 10 Tennis, head on over to Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. To catch up on our blogs, head on over to AIMA International and look for our blog tab, or head on over to Medium. And as always, I'll leave all the links in the episode notes. For something different, head on over to Pink Octopus Books, where my fictional release is. For something left of field, visit Spruik for some random polls. And of course, if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, like, share, and all of the above would be absolutely phenomenal. Uh, for those of you who are interested, we do have scholarships available on AIM International, as well as options to work with me exclusively to optimize your performance and to nudge you closer towards that top 10 tennis ranking. So don't be shy, come and say hi. On that note, thank you so much for listening. I am so incredibly grateful. I'm your host, Dr. Ashley Morgan-Burge, and this is Beyond Top 10 Tennis, and I'll see you next time.